I'm going to pull Lule Demise, our president of Ally Invest, back into the conversation as she's going to have a fireside chat about breaking down barriers for investors uh, with Jeffrey Crutenden of Acorns Day in the Treasury. Before I pass it to you, Lule, I just want to remind our viewers that Lule and Jeff are going to take your questions at the end of their conversation. So be, be sure to type in any questions you have in the chat box for YouTube or in the comments for Facebook and LinkedIn, and we'll get to those at the end. Lule, it's all yours. Thank you, Lindsay, and welcome, Jeff. So today I'm really delighted to have with us um, somebody who is a serial entrepreneur, innovator in FinTech. Uh, Jeff Crudenden is a founder of companies you might have heard of like Acorns, Say, and Treasury. And so we're really excited to have a conversation about the future of investing and where FinTechs play a role in that for regular investors like you and me. Um, so welcome, Jeff. Hi, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Thanks for making it work for us. So before we get started, though, Lindsay, I thought maybe we could get started with the first audience participation question we wanted to, to ask, which is, um, if you believe this statement to be true to you, uh, either say true, and if you don't think it's true to you, say false, which is, I believe I have access to the same playing field as a professional investor. So again, I believe I have this access to the same playing field as a professional investor. And I know that the questions are sort of uh, playing out as you see them. And so we will go back to uh, getting your answers for that um, when we get uh, through asking a few questions of Jeff. So with that, uh, Jeff, tell us, let's start started about in terms of the theme of the power of fintech and what it means to people. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is, can you briefly tell us what fintech is? Uh, what's it? What? Why does it matter to everyday investors and savers? And what's this term robo that often we hear in the fintech context? Yeah, and I think what I'll do is I can I can back up and, and share a little bit around uh, fintech in the context of starting Acorns. Um, when we started that company, actually, uh, fintech wasn't really a widely used word. Maybe some people were using it. Um, others called it financial technology. And one of the big opportunities there is. You know, we have so much familiarity and comfort with using our smartphones today. And, you know, people expect an app that they haven't heard of to revolutionize some aspect of their, their life regularly. And, and there's this window for, for financial uh, services companies to take advantage of that and new brands to actually leverage that and reimagine what it means to offer financial products. And in the case of, of Acorns, we were focused on offering investing to college students initially you know, making it small, uh, frictionless, um, and, uh, and on your phone. And, you know, before that group was really ignored by, by the established uh, financial services companies. And as a fintech, we, we found a new way to deliver investment accounts. And so there are many, many opportunities today to reimagine um, who you're serving and how you serve them. And so in terms of, um, to go back to the question of sort of, why does it matter to regular people and lay, lay people speak what these innovation centers that are, you know, that have been termed a fintech, um, why does it matter for regular investors? Well, I think it probably matters to some and maybe it doesn't matter <laughs> to others. I think that, you know, today it's, it's easier to access financial products and fintech has made many products more accessible, more economical. And, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, a while back, um, you know, in the sake investing, for example, investing was this this big decision that was built up uh, that would happen later in life, and, uh, and it wasn't really accessible to to younger people or people that didn't have enough ass assets. But if you could really make that big decision a smaller decision and deliver the product um, via an app, you know, many more people will actually participate, and so. A lot of the the apps and products that people are taking advantage of, I, I think I think it matters because it's easier than ever to get started, and and it, it takes less less money, less time, less effort um, than ever as well. So if you're you're curious about um, investing or saving or starting, um, you know, a new uh, new found, you know, discipline in the world of, of finance, then you know it's it's a great time to start. And you know there are many great products out there, many products from companies you've heard of, many products maybe from companies you haven't. Um, and uh, so it's a good time to get started. Yeah. 
And, you know, one of the things we know is that, you know, this environment we're in has sort of aired out pockets of our society that are underrepresented in the investing um, conversation and the investing process, which we know is an important tool of building wealth. What, what, what do you think fintechs have done and can continue to do to keep lowering the barriers for entry and other things to, to engage more people to partake in the capital markets and the power that they may have for long-term wealth? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, by, by rethinking how you distribute investment accounts, like let's take, for example, um, Acorns. Uh, obviously, I'm biased. I, I love that example. Um, but I love we're, Ally too, so we're equal. We were, we were focused on, on serving college students. I was a college student when we co-founded the company, and most of my friends and classmates who uh, were interested in investing didn't actually have investment accounts. And so when, what, when we went to the drawing board to actually deliver a product um, that could actually uh, serve these customers, we didn't just have to solve the, the distribution problem. You know, how do we make it a, a simple, easy-to-use app? Under the hood, we had to rethink how can we economically carry small investment accounts, transfers in small dollar amounts, um, and break up these investments into fractional shares of ETFs. And that work um, was really the, the interesting project, the, the work under the hood to actually create something um, that was economical. And so by focusing on this, this uh, customer segment that had effectively been um, disenfranchised in many ways, um, we're seen as not having enough assets, not old enough, maybe talk to us when you're older and have a job. Um, by actually focusing on serving them and actually solving some of the problems to, to um, carry these, these smaller accounts, um, we actually built something that could serve um, all sorts of investors and actually interact with all types of products. And so, um, you know, if you're, if you're part of a group that you feel is underserved uh, or if you're underserved, you know, looking around you and actually studying um, the situation actually may lead to some great ideas and, and innovations. But the hard work of actually sticking through and going through the tedious work to actually economically deliver the product is uh, probably the most you know, important and, and interesting part. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you touch a good point, which is that um, innovations that attempt to include many people end up being beneficial to many more people than the people you started out with, right? Mm -hmm. um, Were you asking me a question there? Yeah, I think we Sorry. suffered through the, the, the Wi-Fi um, challenge of, of modern day. Uh, okay. I was saying, can you hear me now, Jeff? Yep, I hear you loud and clear. Perfect. I was saying that, you know, what's interesting about innovations that attempt to broaden the involvement of many end up typically benefiting even more people than the, the original set that it was trying to do, right? Whether that's in social media and other things that we know of. How do you think in the, in the now when you look at the horizon going forward, do innovators like yourself and Ally Invest and others continue to broaden that involvement? Um, and wh where do you see the innovations going going forward? It's, it's a great question. I think one of the, the, the most special parts of, of introducing someone to a product that, that may not have ac had access to it before is that you get to deal with a a new customer, um, someone that's looking at it from a, a fresh perspective. And, and new customers are generally more curious, enthusiastic, um, they give great feedback. And um, you know, through Acorn serving new investors, the feedback that we get um, is, is much more interesting. You know, new investors ask different questions than seasoned yeah. investors. And in focusing on serving those customers, um, uh, a second company I, I co-founded called Say actually was born. And the reason um, that we started that company is because the investor communications that our new investors that at Acorns were receiving um, weren't really um, accessible, understandable, legible. And, uh, and if, if, if we had been serving um, you know, older or more seasoned investors, it probably would have been chalked up to like, this is a compliance, check the box situation. Um, this is just normal paperwork that you're supposed to effectively ignore as an investor. But the new investor is curious. And, uh, and that's really a, a powerful source of inspiration when thinking about products and thinking about what can be reimagined. Because when you get, to get into it, you know, investor communications and proxy voting 
that's about power for shareholders. You know, a new investor, even a child could understand that having the power to vote your shares was fascinating and interesting. And, uh, and I don't think that that would have been given as close a look if we hadn't been serving uh, new customers. And so there, there are many opportunities when you, um, I, I believe when you actually take some time to introduce um, new customers, new markets, um, and new groups to your product. Yeah, it's it's sort of sort of the benefit of the fresh pair of eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Let me. So I think we have actually the, the answers to some of our question. The first question we asked, which was, I believe I have access to the same playing field as a professional investor, and overwhelming majority said no. So about seventy six percent of our respondents said no. So that's a really interesting uh, pause point for you and me to 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 talk about, sort of like. That sentiment, right? A feeling that I don't have the same playing field. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you find that as well as you speak to investors and customers? And, and how, how do you diagnose it further? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I mean, professional investors, um, you know, this is a world that some people see as, as rigged. Um, and in, in many cases, um, that's, that's not too far from the truth. But, um, but getting started and... Uh, Getting started in a smart way um, is a way to combat that. And you know, I think that you know, in the case of, of Acorns, we focus not on promising you know outsized returns, but you know, market returns. We focus on diversification. We focus on time, not timing. Um, we're putting people into portfolios of um, uh, index ETFs. And I think when you when you look at getting started, like don't get um, seduced by by big promises. If it's too good to be true, then it probably is. Um, but there's a lot of, um, you know, benefit in thinking longer term. And so I guess I would differentiate between, you know, different types of professional investors you may look at out there. Um, certainly, you know, active traders and, and hedge funds seem, um, uh, you know, impossible to compete with. But there are many wise long term investors uh, that focus on um, averaging into the market over the long run. And, and that's a place where, where everybody can start. And so um, I think if you have a little bit of time uh, to, to invest, make sure that you use that time wisely. Uh, and if you expect to be able to trade, uh, you know, like a, like a hedge fund um, by putting a little bit of time in each day, uh, I think that's unlikely. And I don't think that's, that's probably the best goal uh, for you. Um, but if you want to commit more time to it, um, you know, getting started early, uh, starting with smaller amounts uh, is a good way to to get smarter about the market too, because it takes time. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that you look at a response like that, and you know, what you don't want to have is people feel like, oh well, I, you know, the the world is a steep hill, and um, there's no point in in participating. And I think your point is a good one, which is. You know, there's a lot of value in being an index passive investor. You don't have to be, you know, some you know high flying hedge fund manager to use investing as a mechanism for long term wealth. And so, you know, one of the things that we try to do every day with investors is to make sure that they don't give in to that sort of that feeling of you know I'm not able to access because there's a lot to access, and we we have to do is. It's almost like coaches. We have to empower them to be like, yes, you can. And yes, it's possible. And it's not as hard as it used to be um, because of innovators like yourself um, and Ally Invest and other places where, you know, the, the barriers are continuously to be reduced. Um, let's go into now we're going to shift in a little bit into the themes we're talking about, about mm -hmm. how to succeed as a fintech player in that innovator. And we'll use you as a as the as the example, if you will. Tell okay. us about Jeff? Like, how did you get started? I mean, I'm sure people are wondering, like, how is it this guy is so young and he's already founded three companies? Um, it, this is impossible. Even being a founder is, is an uphill struggle. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you, brought, you, you came about being an innovator in this space. Well, you know, of, of course, from, from the outside, everything always looks um, shiny. And uh, in, in building companies, you know, I feel like all the uh, the the victories are public and the the failures are are private <laughs> in many cases. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, it's a tedious process building these businesses. You know, they're not they're not shiny initially. Um, they're um, filled with obstacles. And uh, and I I was very lucky. I, I grew up. My my dad was um, uh, an entrepreneur um, and taught me 
a lot about the business. And uh, I think resilience is, is a big part of that as well. And you know, the problem that we, we found with Acorns is a pretty you know, obvious problem in some, some cases, right? You know, uh, there's a saving and investment problem. More people need to save and invest. Um, getting people started with smaller amounts of money seems like a good way to do it. Um, and leveraging the smart fund to distribute those accounts makes, um, uh, you know, seems like a, a really good strategy. But to actually do it, um, to actually go through it. So you start with that idea, and then the first obstacle you encounter is, okay, who the heck is going to work with us to carry these individual accounts or, or move the money? Who's interested in this? Um, and of course, right off the bat, everyone says no. Now, I would have said no, too. We, we didn't have <laughs> really polished presentation and deck and everything. And, and for some perspective, it took two and a half years from incorporating the company when we actually launched the product. And it wasn't like every day in that two and a half years, we were charging forward, uh, making progress of just victory after victory after victory. No, we, we, were, we came up, up on obstacles that seemed like, oh my gosh, how will we ever figure this out? And it's funny because some of the biggest obstacles for the business ended up being some of the best um, and most valuable parts of the business that we built. And they were usually obstacles related to partnerships and carrying the accounts, partnerships around clearing and custody, um, things that seem sort of boring on the outside, but actually are really essential to power every sort of app. And uh, on that side, you know, we, we couldn't find someone to carry the small accounts at Acorns. And you know what? If we could have, then, you know, the innovation wouldn't, wouldn't really have been as significant, you know? So, so we actually had to, to stumble into to building more powerful financial technology because we were rejected by uh, you know, large custodians and clearing firms and, and potential partners that weren't interested in these accounts. And not because they didn't care about this customer segment as much as they actually couldn't economically carry these accounts. And so yeah. by, by building that new infrastructure from scratch, we were able to you know, drastically reduce the cost to, to service them. Yeah. You know, I think that be you a founder or uh, just starting out as invest in, as an investor, it's a good lesson in terms of um, just the resiliency of the and and the and the love of the tedious. Right? It's like yeah. you're not going to get to that answer unless you sort of embrace the tedious, and that's true for investing at large. Like not just as a founder, but just as a regular investor is sort of like it seems really intimidating, and it's only in breaking it apart and thinking of it in components um, that you start figuring out what's right for you and start understanding the, the actual space. But um, exactly. it's fun to get a, a founder's perspective on that and to also just do yeah. things and be like, listen, it's not all like glory and just blitz. It's just no. it's a lot of sweat equity and a, a lot of good luck, right? And, yeah. and people are capable of understanding the rules. You know, FinTech um, I think is, uh, you know, is, is less accessible than tech because um, you know, it's it's regulated in many cases, and I think yeah. a lot of founders, especially um, young founders, um, are are intimidated by that. They think, how could I possibly build? You know, let's take an extreme example: a bank, right? You know, people people think that that's an impossible um, endeavor. It's actually not. It's extremely tedious, and a lot of the rules are are actually laid out. and And founders um, out there, and entrepreneurs. You're capable of understanding um, these rules, and in fact, if you if you take that on, if you dig into uh, what exactly you need to to build your product, and 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 don't all, I mean there may be partnerships out there that can be helpful, but it's okay to understand and dig in. Well, what is that partner doing for you exactly? And if the partner says no, you know what can you build on your side? Because um, you know if, if you're capable of starting a company, you're capable of understanding um, the rules, and regulations, and other. Um, sort of less sexy parts of the business that um, that are tedious, but I think um, reward founders that actually uh, dig in. Yep, I think that is as I said, it's a real true story for even you know even if you work for a company, having that mindset is really important. Okay. So, sure. um, so let's now shift to a, a different theme. Which, but before we do, so the theme I want to cover is sort of what your perspective is on the future of investing for regular people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but before we do that, I thought maybe we could uh, cram in one more uh, interactive question, if that's okay, Lindsay. Um, so the question we have for you is, if 
ultimately fill in the blank. I find investing blank as when I first started. So do you find investing easier than when you first started, harder than you first started, or about the same? So we'll get back to, to the group answer uh, after a few minutes, but if you could take part in that uh, okay. and a question, that would be interesting for us to, to also cover with Jeff here. So while we're waiting and tabulating those answers, Jeff, let's talk about, as a founder and entrepreneur, how have you seen investing getting more even, if you will, to counter that 76% number we saw from people who felt like it was still um, geared against uh, them and more towards professionals? How can you demystify that for us in terms of how you've seen investing change and become more even playing field since you began as an innovator? Yeah. Well, you know, we've come a long way over the past, you know, 100 plus years. And uh, when we think about, you know, access to, to investing and leveling the playing field, um, it's sort of like two different things. On one hand, you know, do I have the ability to, to invest? And then I think next to that is looking at, you know, where, what are my rights as an investor? Do I have access to those full rights? Can I connect with other investors, um, uh, et cetera? And um, I'm going to talk about, say a little bit in this context, because I think it's, it's important. You know, ev everyday people own um, quite a bit of, of, of everything. Um, now, when everyone's broken up, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's seen as sort of smaller, maybe less significant pieces. Um, but back in the day, when before we had uh, computers uh, or even phones, um, the companies, uh, the, sh the shareholders of companies, um, you know, not only had a financial interest, um, but they have this this governance uh, interest in a in a security. And the actual stock certificates were uh, tickets to to shareholder meetings, and they had badges for people that would say share owner, and um, you know, for the very small number of people that were able to attend these meetings, they actually could participate uh, as owners, and uh, they could, um, you know, connect with one another. They could uh, unite. They could um, uh, make a racket. They could um, do a whole bunch of things. But they they could be heard uh, as share owners. And as we saw, investing um, become more widespread, and um, in back offices um, got outsourced, and you know, people around the country could access investments. Um, uh, either via catalog or via phone or ultimately a computer where we have today, um, some of those other rights uh, got stuck in different parts of of the um, of the infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, when people can't go to physical meetings, you know, how do they vote? Well, they vote by proxy. So there's someone else, um, you know, at the meeting to actually help them vote. But we've seen so much innovation today on the the front end, the interface with how you actually interact with the financial interest of your investment. Um, basically, how much um, is your, are your investments worth at any point in time? Um, that we've missed out on lifting up the, uh, the other part, you know, your right to, to vote your shares, your right to impact what you own. And I think one of the, um, the downsides potentially of, of so much innovation on the front end is it implies that Everything else that isn't elevated to uh, the beautiful mobile um, experience is less important. And so I think the, the future in, of investing has to take that into consideration and lift this other half of investing, um, the, the, the half related to um, you know, your right to, to vote your shares, can communicate with the company um, that you own, other shareholders, et cetera. Uh, needs to be elevated, and I think it's a more interesting right in many ways. Um, and I understand how we how we how we got here, um, but there is there are so many more things that we can do uh, to connect connect people with the companies that they own. And I think it's leveraging an ownership mentality uh, for shareholders uh, versus just a, a pure trading mentality. And you know, trading mentality is effective for many people, uh, but for many long term investors, I think one powerful way uh, to help them um, you know, think longer term and, and drive value from their investments um, is to make sure they have their say and uh, or have a say. And you know, I think the, the companies, the broker dealers, the um, uh, even, even the investment companies uh, where, where people um, uh, can have a say, I think people will value um, uh, you know, their, their investments more where they, where they actually have access to that.
it looks like uh, maybe Lule dropped out. <laughs> um, but that's all right. Uh, I'll I'll uh, keep going on my monologue, if that's okay. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Jeff, Lindsay, Lindsay here. I, I'll, I'll uh, kind of jump in. But yeah, if you had more to finish on that thought, go for <laughs> it. I can uh, take the reins until Lule gets back. I'm sure it's just... Okay, yeah. sure, sure. I hope I didn't uh, bore her talking about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, communications, but um, but there is so much more um, interaction to be had out there, and a lot of people are, um, you know, some some are worried or anxious and saying, hey, if 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 millions of people are given, uh, you know, easy access to to voting their shares or um, uh, communicating with the companies they own, it's going to cause chaos. And I, I actually disagree with that. I understand the concern, which is, you know. How, you know, you don't want to let small shareholders, um, uh, you know, cause a, a massive distraction or, or or hurt the companies. But you know, the owners of your company um, that that know they're an owner um, generally want to see the company uh, succeed. Um, if they can be helpful, the questions that they um, ask may be uncomfortable sometimes. But if you think of you know physical shareholder meetings, um, you know, if the if the entire audience uh, is erupting. Um, you know, either, you know, uh, in, in anger or, or in joy, you should know that. And if a small fraction of shareholders um, are upset, set, but, uh, but that's not really shared by the rest, that's also helpful. And that can help separate out, uh, you know, noise from, from valid concerns out there. And today, you know, you have so many people, um, you know, screaming to be heard on, on social media, yet um, many, many, many of these people are, are owners uh, maybe in small amounts uh, of the very companies uh, that um, that they're um, concerned with, and so um, yeah. there's a lot of exciting possibilities in in connecting share owners with uh, with one another in the companies they own, and a lot of good that can come of it to support companies. And the communication doesn't always have to start with the shareholder. the 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 issuer uh, or company could actually, um, you know, welcome their new shareholders on put questions to them and actually engage them. And so there's a lot of opportunity there, both on the broker dealer side, the investor side and the, the issuer and company side. What do you say to those small investors that, you know, they think their vote doesn't count. I mean, we're, we're about to go into a presidential election here. Uh, it's almost a very similar type of mindset for a lot of people. As they think about the shares that they own, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't own a big enough chunk of the company for it to matter. My my voice to matter. Yeah, well, I I think to a lot of these people, I'd say if you think your tweet matters, um, <laughs> I promise you, your vote matters more. Uh, and um, you know, if you think of of um, you know uh, you know speaking as an owner, um, if you if you if you're uh, an owner and a shareholder, and you're not speaking up as one, um, especially in cases as it relates to the company that you own, um, you're missing out on an opportunity to be heard uh, in a different way. And uh, and a lot of people don't participate. And so the the shareholders that do participate, um, I think, actually have an outsized opportunity um, uh, to be heard. We've got Lule back. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm reminded of that old movie that's like, that's entertainment. Like the show must go on. I apologize. No I'm, problem. It's because there's so many people online watching this this conference, right, Lindsay? There's the only other way. Sorry, a Wi-Fi failure in Brooklyn, New York. Jeff, I apologize. Okay. So I, I thank you again, Lindsay, for stepping in and uh, continuing the conversation. So, you know, I remember, Jeff, when we first started talking about Say and what you're doing there and First of all, fantastic word for what you're doing, right? To have a say. Um, and I remember you showed me a picture of like this black and white picture. I think it was like the first GE or General Motors uh, shareholders meeting, if I recall. And yeah, there were like people that like regular people, right? Yeah. Raising their hands in a fist and talking about their perspective and what's happening. And I think that's that's a really important sort of element of getting more people engaged in investing, which is a sense of ownership, right? That's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of times um, investment strategists like Lindsay, Lindsay talk about, like, start with what you know, right? What do you yeah. consume? Uh, is that something you would um, go and, and invest in, perhaps, to have a, a better connection point? But I think you take it to the next level. It's not just what do you consume, but that you actually have a say, 
right? Um, and you're not just as, um, you know, and that's part of like beating out the 76% the malaise that we saw in our answer, feeling outnumbered and outpowered by a broader institutional voice, a professional voice. So I, I love that. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, so by the way, if we have the answers, Lindsay, that we have, we just asked questions about, is it easier or harder? We'd love to see those as well. And I think we saw um, the answer for, oh, what is that one? What's the biggest number one? I, I don't see it as, as, um, as well. Easier. Um, easier. So easier outnumbered every, uh, which is, I mean, I mean, that talk about cognitive dissonance, right? 76% responded that it is not as flat opportunity wise um, and professionals have a skew, but it's still easier as an individual investor to engage now than before. I think that's a fascinating dynamic. What's your take on that, Jeff, that you've got a feeling of professionals have better access versus I still think it's much easier for me now than it used to be. Well, it's interesting. I Even if I look at when I first started investing, I think over time, I, I found it harder <laughs> personally, um, <laughs> which is probably one reason why I, I moved towards focusing on um, index fund investing uh, on my side. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of confidence that comes from uh, from getting started too. Um, and, and people, um, you know, uh, you know, learn a lot more. A lot of the the intimidating parts of investing are are demystified. I mean, this is an industry that's that's built up partially by Sort of being mysterious and inaccessible, you know, when you talk to the average person about getting started that isn't an investor, um, it's usually something they they want to think about. They want to talk to uh, an expert on it, and uh, and a lot of fear of of making a mistake. And so I imagine when people get started, um, you know, dipping their toe in the water, um, they realize, hey, you know, I'm capable of of understanding, um, you know, a lot of this, and uh, maybe that impacts it. It's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I know the, the saying is practice makes perfect, but maybe it's just practice makes easier. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, absolutely. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, so now let's shift to sort of um, something that is a very much of the now for us, right? Which is the reality of folks that the society being that much more aware of the skewed nature of involvement in investing, right? Um, either it being from a gender lens or, um, you know, a color lens or other um, identity dynamics. Uh, there's definitely, you know, investing has not escaped those societal imbalances. Yeah. How do you, as a, as a founder and an innovator, think about uh, further, um, you know, flattening that curve so more folks are in it? Because I don't, I don't, I used to think it was just about access. But the reality is things are now much more accessible, right? They're cheaper and minimums are higher, I mean, lower, um, but there's still a malaise of engagement um, among different kinds of pockets of our society. How are you thinking about it as an innovator in flattening that? Yeah, so, you know, um, I like what you have on the screen here too, the, the, the mental barrier there in terms of, do I have permission to do this? I think you see it both from, from, a, from a founder perspective and starting businesses, but also, from a customer perspective, um, you know this is a an industry where um, it's it's hard not to compare yourself to others, right? You know, if you're thinking of opening an investment account, um, you don't necessarily want to be the smallest investment account at this company, right? That you're looking at, at going with. A lot of people, I think, are are anxious um, around uh, you know how they stack up. Is this something they're they're allowed to do? Um, and I think that's um, you know a result. In many ways, of this this industry feeling quite exclusive for a long time, and, uh, and so it's sort of natural to say, "Hey, you know, can I do this?" Um, you know, uh, only a certain number of people I ever met in my life were investors, or that seemed like something um, that only um, you know wealthy people could do. And um, what helps is I actually think technology is quite helpful there. Um, I think that um, you know some of the established um, you know large large banks in many ways, a lot of the, the weight that they carry in their brand may have the unintended consequence of feeling uh, less accessible, you know, sort of the exclusivity, um, uh, you know, um, negatively impacts, um, not intentionally, but it, it, people think, you know, I can't open an account there. Um, it's not for me, but the opportunity on FinTech is to, to reimagine that because, because tech is a lot more accessible and, mm -hmm. and, and finance can, can actually, enter in 
through the goodwill and accessibility around tech. And, uh, and that's what's, uh, I think, a huge opportunity for, for new brands, for digital brands, and for um, financial technology companies um, to, to leverage. And so, you know, the way that you distribute products, you know, if you think about it in terms of, of onboarding, uh, which is something we focus on at, at Treasury, which is um, uh, a fund that I've put together with um, uh, Eli Braverman, who co-founded uh, Betterment, and James Layfield, who co-founded uh, Rise. We, we think that, you know, having a product that people can access is different than a product that can easily onboard customers. And onboarding is deeply connected into you know, psychology. It's connected into the infrastructure um, of the business, you know, does your um, uh, like regulatory infrastructure and technology support seamless onboarding of, uh, of customers uh, or is it the other way around? And then the, uh, the customer experience and you know, how people uh, share these products with one another. You know, certain products are more shareable, others aren't. Um, depending on how people share those products, it may alienate some customers and not others. Um, but I, I'm optimistic that the, uh, that the sort of app world that we live in in many ways um, is actually getting more people to consider products that they, they, they previously thought weren't for them. Because um, I do think it's difficult to sell products um, through institutions that have felt um, very exclusive for a long time and to say, hey, now we're selling this to everyone. Um, whereas the, you know, the app store um, and, the, uh, and that world have been so open and inviting, it's maybe easier to access it through, through that world, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, one of the things we found also at Ally is that um, as, in addition to technology, the simplicity of design and not yeah. having too much complexity is another way of inviting people into, you can do this too, right? Um, I do think that our industry suffers from um, a door that looks really impenetrable. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Onboarding in that first portal um, is the first way you're setting the table for people to see um, how do they engage and how easy is it for, for them to engage. Um, I think you know, that, go ahead. Let's say just on that, on that point, which is a good point, the you know, in the world of investing, you know, if, if we can, you know, to encourage people to get started, if we can shift from, you know, what do I invest? The question being, you know, what do I invest into? Uh, should I invest or, or you know, um, you know, uh, should I just get started? Um, it's easier because then people get started. This is a decision that people wrestle with, right? People don't want to make mistakes. And this is a world where, oh, if I make a mistake, if I pick the wrong stock, then I've messed up. And then people wait, you know, years or decades to get started. Um, but sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, yeah. And I think the key to that is to start small, right? So that the loss doesn't feel as consequential. Um, but you kind of live through it and you understand that there's ups and downs in investing. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's really um, another thing that I feel on this topic of, of um, our um, investing arena not having as much participation in some certain segments of our society. Um, and you're right, technology is not the case, right? So social media doesn't suffer from uh, ill participation of different pockets of society, right? As the way perhaps our industry does. Um, and I think part of it is this idea of seeing yourself, right? Like, I just think our industry hasn't done enough of a job uh, showing investors of different kinds of skew and hues that they too belong in this space as investors. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be interesting also for us to figure out how to incorporate that into the, as you call it, the psychology of, of designing these experiences. Mm -hmm. So tell me about now, we're going to ask questions in a few minutes, but before we do, um, I want to shift now to uh, what you have found to be the biggest surprises for yourself in terms of things when you first got started where you thought, well, well this is just not going to be possible to break down. Investors are just eternally going to have a hard time with this. Um, and ones that you've literally, you know, pummeled to simplicity versus things that you thought was really easy. And then when you opened it up was really complex and you're still banging at that door to try to make it simple. Can you give us some aha moments in your experience as an entrepreneur and innovator? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, in the beginning, uh, we, 
Uh, so, so our, our first investment product at, at Acorns, you know, we were uh, investing in portfolios of, um, uh, of index ETFs. Um, our customers invested in, in dollars and not in shares. And we were very stressed about how that um, could get properly communicated. We thought people would get um, really confused and, and bogged down in it. Um, but what was powerful is once people actually made the, the initial investment, um, they were so prepared to actually dig in and learn about their investments. It's almost a flip, right? I mean, people need to understand what they're investing in, but when you bring the threshold down um, and, and they can just get started, then they're actually uh, more likely to pay attention when you're trying to teach them about their investments. And so um, we found that that actually was, um, uh, that became more accessible. So I guess that's something that- Wow, that's helped. interesting. So you're saying basically like, rather than preload them with education because you think it's going to take so much to get them started you found that getting them started and then overlaying that with tech with education and other things was a better path for engagement much better much better now that doesn't mean people should invest you know a thousand dollars without learning but yeah. when you threshold down to to five dollars you have them participate in a diversified portfolio you still need to be clear in what they're investing but you have to recognize that that people tend to care more when they have some skin in the game. And, uh, and $5 wow. is a cheap ticket uh, to actually engage uh, and learn as an investor. And, and, and it's shocking to me that, that you know, we would have anyone graduate college, for example, without an investment account. Um, mm -hmm. It's crazy. Um, you know, people um, tend to care more when, they, uh, when they're engaged um, as an investor, just like they care more about you know, voting uh, as an investor as well. Um, and I think next to that is the the content, the news. Um, you know, when you um, create new investors, they tend to be curious about all aspects of investing. And so what we had found is, you know, once customers started investing, they were curious um, around uh, you know other financial content. And so Acorns launched um, Grow uh, to to support them. And so yeah, there, there's there's this opportunity. This is what happens when you bring the threshold down. You know, before you have, you could only start with you know thousands of dollars to invest. And so the psychology was different. And today, if you bring the threshold down, um, you can make the big decision small, but you still have to build it back up again, um, you know, the, the significance of it with, with education. So education is extremely important, but you can actually um, find a more attentive student uh, if they're actually engaged as, a, as an investor. I think that's really wise insight for investors who are kind of sitting on the sidelines nervous. Um, that ultimately the, the thing that breaks that nervousness is to make the, the risk smaller and, yeah. jump and trying out. Um, I think that's a really, um, you know, it, it's actually not dissimilar to other things in life, but I think a lot of times when money is concerned, people don't apply those same wisdoms that apply to the rest of life. And on that count, um, tell us, and this will be my last question. And then maybe Lindsay, we can ask, we can, if there are any audience questions we can, we can pose to Jeff. Um, how have you factored um, investor psychology, emotion, uh, behavior in the way that you do design services, right? A lot of times, I think traditionally our industry has said investing is a logical pursuit, right? There's risk and then there's a return and it's finding that intersection point that's right for you. And so there that is, press the button and presto, you're gone. And yet we still have a lot of people feeling a little nervous about pressing that button. Um, yeah. so how have you, whether it's at the initial stages or emboldening them to get more involved, what are some of the insights that you found there? Yeah. So, you know, investing, you know, in, in many ways it, it should be logical. Um, but in, in the way that people engage initially, um, in many cases, it can be emotional and, and designing around that, that customer experience or, or user experience, we don't really like calling customers users, but um, that that's one of the big opportunities for fintech too, because you can start there, and then you can design your business um, around it. And so, uh, to have a product that someone can can hear about, um, just a, a few lines, maybe a sentence, and say, "Hey," and maybe they're on on Facebook going through their newsfeed, and and you can capture their attention, like, "Hey, this is something maybe I could get started with." Right. So you have to bring the the decision down um, to something that's bearable. Um, if you're thinking about it, where people are, 
um, and where you're finding these customers, you know, they're going through memes, um, uh, pictures of friends and other things. Um, if you introduce in the middle of that, you know, a heavy conversation around like retirement, you know, saying like, have you thought about retirement? It's like, whoa, this is too heavy. <laughs> I was just looking at a meme. Um, uh, not that you should use memes, but you need to bring the, the um, uh, sort of the, the, the emotional friction uh, down a bit. Um, and so that's why getting started with small amounts, that's why even suggesting the amount for people to start with is helpful, like spare change and other ways to automate it um, can, be, can be really powerful. And so um, I guess it's both emotional and, and logical because you know, you're dealing with a lot today. Um, you're yeah. dealing with, you know, you, people are bombarded with notifications. You know, people are unlikely to look at their phone in any given app, maybe except for you know Instagram um, uh, or Facebook, you know outside of a few minutes. And so, if your product requires undivided attention uh, for a significant period of time to onboard someone, I think you're going to struggle. Um, and so, you have to get someone engaged. They have to realize it's something that uh, is doable um, on their smartphone in a short period of time. And then, you know, even by the time they may finish registration, for example, they're they're ready to engage. Uh, more deeply. So someone that starts out looking to invest spare change is ready to invest, um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of dollars in many cases by the time they finish registration. So you have to be careful um, and thoughtful in how you build up uh, the decision idea as you move along. And, uh, and having a, a flexible um, company and structure to do that is, um, is important. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I am sure you've enjoyed being the founder of the companies you've had that I enjoy about Ally in general is as a fintech is just, it is so maniacally focused and all of us are striving for better. None of us have reached perfection, but this focus of reduction of barrier and being in the context of where people are instead of asking them to pull that you themselves into your context, I think is a really important point that you're making. Point. Yeah. So any questions from um, the chat, Lindsay, cause I can't see the chat. so. Um, any questions that um, that you might want to pose? We want to pose for Jeff. Yeah, uh, we definitely have a couple questions, but I'll just remind the viewers: whether you're on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, please write any questions you have for Jeff or even Lule um, at this time in the chat box on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook and LinkedIn, and we'll try to get some of those answered for you. Um, but based on where you just ended the conversation, Lule and Jeff, what I would ask you as the two of you come together from two different fintech firms, how do two firms like you talking in a, in a forum like this help the industry in general overall? Some people might find this type of conversation a little bit odd because technically you're competitors. It does, right? It does sound odd. Like what the heck are, in the old days, you know, having, uh, you know, a traditional two banks having a conference that's speaking to their customers and uh, would-be investors together um, in a traditional lens, I think would definitely be odd. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, I'm sure Jeff will add on, you know, I think that the evolution we're trying to um, sort of seed at companies like the ones that Jeff has founded at Ally Invest, Ally at Large, is that, you know, it's a centricity to the client interest and to the investor interest. And so if when you focus just on that point, it becomes less material about you, right? And when you're worried about just like, that's my competitor, this is that, you're not really affording um, investors and the public the thought leadership that happens by people who are trying to change this landscape. And I think that folks like Jeff and Ally Invest and others are trying to change this landscape to both uh, signal to investors, you too could do this, you can come in, uh, to signal to them, this is how why are your inve the investment landscape is changing. So that 76% we saw in that answer uh, keeps going down. So people don't feel so um, like the system is rigged. Um, and then it also makes sure that it holds us out there to say, this is what we promise to try to do, reduce the barrier to entry, understand emotions and behavior and you're in the way you invest. This is how we coach you in starting out. So for a few reasons, but I think it makes sense that we are opening up the landscape for that conversation for our own customers to see. And to piggyback on there, well, first I uh, love Lule, and, and we've known each other for for many years. Um, and next to that, you know, this is a really big market, and there are there are many al allies to be found um, out there, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> um, and 
you know, when we were starting uh, Acorns, um, you know, fintech was seen as a pretty small market and every other fintech company was suggested as, as some uh, competitor or threat to us. And, and really, um, it, it's almost the opposite. They're, these are um, people that, that share um, a mission um, and, and a vision, and uh, we may have different strategies, but, but uh, and oftentimes our, our customers are different as well. Um, and so um, I find some of the most interesting people to talk to um, are the people that uh, run or have started um, what many view as potential competitors. Um, and uh, these are people that, you know, if you're a founder out there, um, you know, you should uh, connect with and, and talk to. And if you're running a business out there, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, insight um, to be shared and then friends to be had. All right. Great, great responses there. Um, we are getting a few more questions. Jeffrey, is Acorn using any blockchain technology? One person wants to know. No, uh, not today. No, not today. Um, we actually had Lex Sokolin uh, present earlier today, and he was talking about how a lot of fintechs have been created to focus on specific uh, services within the financial industry, and his prediction was, and you're starting to see a rebundling of those services. Um, is that a trend that you expect to, that you see coming and expect to accelerate in the coming uh, years? And the question really goes out to both of you. Jeff, if you want to go first. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's a consequence of the opportunity and onboarding for fintech and onboarding for particular services. Um, if you can del deliver a really uh, zeroed in or dialed in um, experience, which, which many fintechs uh, are well designed to do, and then you can back out from there and add additional services on, um, I, I, I see the, the trend continuing. And I think um, some fintechs out there may even have um, effectively an unstoppable advantage in some cases with how they can effectively onboard customers and how they can deliver new products, especially if their company and infrastructure is designed to support it. If I may piggyback on that question, Lindsay, um, one of the things that Lex was talking about, who I don't, I mean, who had some really interesting pearls of futuristic insight for us, um, was the increasing role of gamification um, in different kinds of um, industries, including financial services, in the in the eventual future, increasing that. How do you consider um, the merits or drawbacks of gamification in the way that you design client experiences? How do, how do we we consider gamification in the design? Of yeah. That? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, it's I consider it part of you know user experience, um, and you know I think of um, gamification as really an extension of of how people. Um, use their phones. And so there's familiarity in how you use certain products. And I think that needs to translate in um, in financial services products to take full advantage of, of the medium. And so I spoke earlier about, um, you know, this opportunity for, for finance to leverage the goodwill around tech. And, and to fully do that, uh, taking into consideration how people use other products, whether it be games or social media products um, or others that should inform um, the, uh, the, the the financial product uh, as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm always struggling with it because I, I think it's inevitable. Um, the question is sort of how do you um, evoke the benefits of it versus what I would consider to be some of the dangers of it, right? The instinct to um, want to get quick gains, et cetera. Those things I think could be the dangers of it as well. So it'll be interesting to see how our industry adopts it um, into uh, the user experience as you, you know, sort of approach. Um, Lindsay, any other questions? Yeah, um, one came in, this one's interesting. How do you tune the noise out that comes in from unreliable sources? You both talked about education, um, like TikTok influencers that are giving investment advice with little to no experience. How do you get them to focus on, you know, the decision you're having them make, Jeff, which we, you say, bringing a big decision, making it small. How do you get them to focus there instead of being distracted by all these other things that are out there? Yeah, well, there, there's a lot of noise out there. Um, and there's a lot of people that, that mean well and, and, and are curious. I think, you know, 
uh, if you look at the time period in, in which someone's giving advice, you know, TikTok's maybe the most extreme example, maybe someone that's, that's been popular for a few weeks or a few months, uh, giving a, a little blip uh, of advice. Um, you know, when people are, are feeling like they're, they're doing well, um, especially if they're, they're young and it's the first time they're investing, um, you know, it's easy to feel on top of the world. And so, um, you know, I, I would be, be careful <laughs> who you listen to. And, and usually um, older investors who have been through some ups and downs uh, have a lot of wisdom to share. Um, someone may be young and a great stock picker in, in the short term. But, uh, it's a bit harder over the long term. And so, you know, maybe you can look and pick out, see how that, how that video um, uh, holds up uh, in a few months or, or a few years. Um, but uh, I would not take advice from, from TikTok like that, but, but maybe, maybe, um, you know, I'm wrong there. No, I mean, I think this is where you're, you know, we were talking about sort of the downside and the upside of gamification, right? Um, you know, I think for us at Ally Invest, what we have seen from customers over and over again is that as digitized as the world gets because of the volume of information that you're talking about, people are hungering for pure advice and guidance. Um, and so I think that's probably going to be interesting for us to, you know, players like ourselves and you continue to, inv to sort of evolve that space to, to declutter the world for retail investors. Because I think that cluttering, just like the high barriers to entry used to keep them away, mm -hmm. uh, I that the cluttering could also keep them away. And so um, I think that if we continue to try to declutter with either simplicity of our experiences or the advice we give people, um, and the assistance we give people, I think it'll go a long way. So I think we're at, coming at time. Jeff, it was such a pleasure having this chat with you. Um, and I, thank you for joining us today. Good luck with your latest venture in Treasury. <laughs>